Hi, listeners. Welcome back to Adopting the Podcast. As always, I'm so excited to be your host for this journey. I'm Nicole Witt, Executive Director of the Adoption Consultancy, where we guide pre-adoptive parents step-by-step through the adoption journey. In adopting the podcast, we're going to focus on the issues, questions, and concerns you have as you get started in your adoption journey. This is for people just considering adoption, brand new to adoption, or very early in the process who are just trying to kind of get their questions answered and figure out their best path forward, learn about what to expect and how the process works. However, today we are jumping ahead in the adoption process to the ultimate goal, parenthood. So I know that up until now, we've been taking baby steps, pardon the pun, through what the adoption process could look like. But from my work with clients, I find that many people can't focus on their to-do list until they get some of their bigger questions and concerns addressed. And one of those is, will I bond with an adopted baby? And I think a more detailed yet often unspoken concern that underlies that one is actually, will I know how to take care of the baby to meet his or her needs? Both the needs that all newborns have, as well as any particular needs that an adopted baby might have. So today we're going to address those fears and concerns head on. I have Valerie Trumbauer with me to talk about the type of care that all babies need, as well as tips that are specific to adoptive parents. Valerie is a DONA certified postpartum doula, a certified lactation counselor, and the mother of three, including a set of twins. Her online courses, Expecting 101 and Expecting 101 You're Adopting, have helped hundreds of families prepare for life with their newborns. For all things baby, follow her on Instagram at New Parents Academy. Thanks so much for being here today, Valerie. Thanks for having me, Nicole. I'm excited about this. Awesome. Well, let's start at the very beginning, even before there is a newborn to care for, setting up the home and nursery. People can find all kinds of general information and advice about that online, but is there anything different that adoptive parents should take into consideration as they set up their home? Each family is so different, and even within the hundreds of people who take Expecting 101, you're adopting people people's comfort level is different. So what one family might be comfortable buying, another family wants to wait on. And so that's why I talk to people about, here's a 30-day must-have list of what you need to have for the first 30 days. And some people are like, yes, I'm going to go buy all of those things now. And for some people, they want to wait until they've been matched or they've gotten that call. So I think probably depending on your comfort level, just knowing what that list looks like for you. So if you're not going to buy it now, maybe you have money set aside or you have a picture of what that looks like. So like an example is an infant seat. So I talk about understanding how to safely install that infant seat, how to know that it's installed correctly. But for some families who are adopting, they're like, you know what? I don't want to buy that right now. I want to have it shipped to where the baby's born. Or So whatever your comfort level is or whatever works for you, I think is important to note. But no, you know, okay, the infant seat I think we're going to get is $200 or whatever the case is. So it is a little bit different in that respect you know, you might decide that you're not going to buy each thing right now, but understanding what you're going to get when you're comfortable with that. So yeah. And I think just even seeing that list and having it in hand probably takes a lot of the anxiety away from people. It's, it's the unknown that that can make things so scary, right? So knowing, okay, I've got the list. I know exactly what I'm going to need at what point. Oh, for sure. And I think, you know, a store like Bye Bye Baby, like I love Bye Bye Baby. It's like I walk in there and I'm like, oh my goodness, I could walk these aisles. For so many people, that store like makes their heart rate increase and right. that it's too much because there are there is so much baby gear out there. So as you start to, you know, especially with my families who are preparing to adopt, there's a lot to know. And there's a lot of all these, you know, so many different things to know. It's like, okay, this also feels overwhelming. And I don't want that to be the case. And that's where that 30 day list, or even like I have a bigger list called must haves and maybes list. That's that bigger list. All of that stuff that's in bye bye baby or is on Amazon baby and brings it down to be like, here you go. This is what you actually need. 
this is what's good to have. So it takes some of the confusion and stress out of that. Right. Excellent. We're all about that. Okay. So let's talk about once there's actually a newborn at home. And obviously much of newborn care is the same for for adopted babies and non-adopted babies. So, so let's start there. Um, you have told me that there are three things about life with a newborn that are really helpful for adoptive parents to understand before the baby arrives. So what's number one? Okay. Yes. So I'm excited to talk about these things because as you said, so many of the things are the same. Like I can tell you how to burp a baby three different ways. And it doesn't matter how that baby came into your life. But I like to speak to these situations from an adoptive standpoint. So when you're, so some things are different and some things are the same. So the three things that we're going to talk about today, I think are really important because it builds the confidence of new parents. So much of what I do as a doula just helps people to understand, okay, let's understand when something's normal, even if it feels a little off and let's understand, you know, because something like crying and that's the first thing we're going to talk about, you know, let's understand when something's normal and when something is a cause for concern. So um, I like to touch on, on these three things today. So what we're going to talk about for number one, is that the baby will cry. Okay. So that's number one. And it seems super basic that it's like, okay, you've brought this person on and her like groundbreaking number one is that the baby (laughs) will cry. (laughs) But I, I promise you it's so important. And I talk to the families in my programs about understanding that this is as if the baby is born speaking a language that you are not fluent in. So that language is crying. And when we can look at it that way, as if you picture, you know, oh, we had, we, you know, adopted this baby who only speaks Portuguese and we don't speak Portuguese. That kind of takes some of the anxiety away from it because we associate crying with pain, you know? So if, you know, an adult, came to my front door right now and is crying. It's like, oh my gosh, what's wrong? Well, that's very different than a baby who's crying. And babies spend a lot of time crying, but they're crying because it is their only source of communication. And when you can understand that, it helps you to not take that crying personally. So as an adoptive family, you're going to be in this situation where this new little person in your life is spending a lot of time crying. And I find that people are so quick to say, you know, is this baby crying because they don't know me? Is the baby crying because I'm not the birth mother? And that, understand the baby is crying because they're, it's their only source of communication. So it's a matter of trying to help understand why the baby's crying, how you can get her to be more comfortable. But, uh, you know, it's just so important to understand this is the baby's only form of communication. Please don't take that crying personally. (laughs) I think that's a really, really important point. Um, What is the second one on your list? Okay. So number two on my list is that you can't spoil a newborn. And people worry about this a lot. People are so quick to, to think like, am I doing something wrong? Am I forming bad habits? If I hold this baby, you know, the baby loves to be rocked to sleep. If I rock the baby to sleep, am I doing something wrong? And as a doula, when I get to people's homes, so I only, as a doula, I only work overnight. So I work 10 PM to 6 AM. So sometimes I'll get there at 9 45 and they feel like they're in trouble. Like I'm going to (laughs) like yell at them. They're like, I've been holding her for an hour. And it's like, okay, that's okay. You're getting to know this baby. And so taking away that stress of feeling like, there's some rule that you need to be following or something that you need to be doing, I think it can be really helpful. Just show yourself grace. You're all getting to know each other. And then I don't know if your listeners or anything like the people in my world, it is that they're, it's like, okay, you can't spoil a newborn. When can I spoil the baby? (laughs) You know, when is that possible? And people, I feel like I'm a planner. There's a lot of planners in my community here and like on Instagram or inside of my courses. And so I understand, I respect that feeling of like, okay, you said I can't spoil the baby. And there's not a switch that goes off. And that's one thing that I want your listeners to understand is like, it's not, okay, you can't spoil a baby for the first week, but on day eight, boy, watch out (laughs) because you can spoil that baby. That's not the case either. It is that you want to start as you get more comfortable and depending on where the baby was born, when ICPC happens, all of these factors 
you might not get home into your house for a couple of weeks. So show yourself some grace. But after you've gotten into a little bit of a rhythm after, you know, one or two weeks at home, start to look at things and ask yourself if that's how you want it to go down the road. So if every afternoon after you feed the baby, you sit on the couch and you watch an episode of your favorite Netflix show while the baby's cuddled with you, that's fine. And that's great that you're having this cuddle time, but start to look at it as, do you want your four month old to take his afternoon nap on you? If the answer is like, no, sometime I want to shower or meal alone, then you start to realize like, okay, we need to introduce something different here. But in the beginning, when you are getting to know this new little person, show yourself grace and just realize there's nothing you can do that will spoil that baby. Okay. Awesome. Great, great information. Um, so what is your number three? Okay. So for number three is to understand that you are all doing something that you've never done before. So, I mean, all of you in this, you know, you, your partner, your husband, whatever the situation is, and the baby are doing Mm -hmm. something that you've never done before. I talk a lot about grace and showing yourself grace. And so just understand that even if you have older kids, maybe you're adopting a baby and you have two children, each baby is different. Your circumstances are different. And so, you know, understanding that it's going to be a little bit bumpy. There's going to be nights where you're like, oh gosh, that could have gone better. Or I wish I didn't do that. (laughs) And that's okay. You're all getting to know each other and the baby is adjusting. And the baby's not just adjusting because you're not the birth mom. The baby's adjusting because he's living outside the belly. He is breathing air. This baby has lived in fluid and not had to take a bottle or anything like that. So this is a time of adjustment for everyone. So sometimes people are so quick to say, oh my gosh, I feel like I, you know, the baby's crying. I have no idea what he wants. And it's like, baby's only five days old. First of all, baby probably (laughs) doesn't, you know, he probably, (laughs) there's times where, I mean, there are clues and I talk about it inside my program, like if the baby's doing this, you know, if the baby's tummy is hard and he's arching his back, let's talk about ways to relieve gas. And we walk through a lot of different scenarios, but just like you and I get to the point where we're just like losing our marbles sometimes. And it's like, I don't even know what I want. I just know I feel miserable. That's how the baby's feeling, you know, or overtired or things like that. So don't think like, oh my gosh, I feel so horrible. I don't know what this baby wants right now you've only known that baby for a few days. So just showing yourself some grace. That is an important theme, I think, in in all (laughs) parts of our lives. Um, Well, and I I mean, my kids, I have twins that are 12 and a 15 year old. And still there's times where we'll say to my daughter, like, okay, we don't really know what we're doing. You know, I feel like you always, you always thought your parents knew what they were doing. We're like, okay, we don't. Like you're the oldest. Sorry, we're still right. <laughs> figuring it out. Well, let's talk about some areas where the actual newborn care is different for the adoptive parents. And the first one being bonding. And and of course, I mean, every parent needs to bond with their baby. And it's not necessarily an instant thing, either for those who give birth to their baby or those who adopt their baby. Um, and then sometimes it can be instant for both of those groups. But with adoptive parents, given that they haven't had the nine months to kind of get used to each other, the process is a bit different. And and I know it can be a great area of concern for adoptive parents. So generally, what do you recommend to encourage that early bonding? So I have like a whole video where I talk about this inside of my program, but I want to talk today, just if I could pick one thing out, it's something that people can do from day one, whether you, you know, the baby's in the NICU and you got to go see the baby or, you know, you just met the baby or in this hotel room or whatever the case. And that is skin to skin. It's also called kangaroo care sometimes. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about understanding how to do this safely, why it's so important, and then when you would do it and when isn't a good time to do it. So in understanding that, like what it looks like, what, what skin to skin looks like is that the baby is wearing only a diaper. So just a diaper. And then mom or dad is placing the baby directly on their chest. So mom could be wearing a bra, doesn't need to be, could have like a little blanket, a light blanket Mm -hmm. over top. Dad's placing baby on his bare chest, covering with a light blanket. Men tend to be 
hotter than women, <laughs> they might not need the blanket. You're just kind of feeling the baby's hands and feet to understand, you know, is the baby chilly? Just lay a light blanket over that, over the baby. And so that's what skin to skin looks like. It's the baby, just as it sounds, the baby skin up against your skin. And the reason that you're doing skin to skin is for a couple of different reasons. It helps to familiarize the baby with your heartbeat, with your smell and your voice, and it helps the baby to feel safe. So the baby is getting to know you because he's literally right there, right underneath your chin. And because you and the baby are so close during this time, it helps you to, you know, get a different view, helps you to understand the baby's cues. You know, he might be laying on your chest and you see him like arches back. And then maybe he like, toots and has a little gas. And you're like, Oh, now I just learned something. I learned that like when he does this, that usually happens. Or, you know, you see him put his fingers up to his mouth and suck on his fingers, which is, you know, a hunger cue. And so you start to, to get a different view of those things. And skin to skin is shown to calm everyone involved, shown to calm mom or dad, as well as the baby. So that's, that's why you're doing skin to skin. And then what, if we think about where to do skin to skin, really anywhere, as I said, um, if the baby's in the NICU and mom or dad is able to go in there, depending on what's going on in the world, you can t let the nurses know, like as soon as it's possible, we would like to do skin to skin. Now, once the baby is discharged, like cuddling up on the couch is great. You're reading a book, you're watching Netflix, you're doing you know, whatever you want to do while the baby's right there. And the baby will likely be asleep for a lot of mm -hmm. this. And it doesn't have to be like, all you're doing is like, okay, I'm going to sit here and watch the baby on my chest. It's just that you're kind of going about, you know, you're going to read or you're going to watch TV or something and the baby's cuddling close to you. So the thing is that you only want to do skin to skin when you are sure that you won't fall asleep. So we've all seen those pictures of like, oh, that's so cute. They're both asleep on the couch. What that doesn't, those pictures drive me crazy because it's like, <laughs> no, there's this side of things where like the baby can fall into like between your body and your right. couch. There's all of these horrible things that can happen. So skin to skin is amazing. And it's something that you certainly want to do, but you don't want to do it when it's possible that you would fall asleep. And the last thing that I wanted to say about skin to skin is once you put the baby on your chest, sometimes, you know, these teeny tiny babies, they don't have a lot of neck control. They're just kind of getting to know their own bodies. You might find that the baby like burrows his nose into your chest. You want to just turn his head and then that light blanket you have would be down by his shoulders. So nothing is obstructing his airway at all. But so if you can do it safely, and that's, you know, kind of what we're talking about here, it's a great way to get to know the baby and understand his cues. Awesome. Awesome advice, Valerie. Now you referenced uh, if the baby's possibly in NICU. So I wanted to ask about that. If the baby's in NICU, whether it's for a couple of days or for an extended period of time, what kinds of things besides doing skin to skin whenever they can, what can adoptive parents do to encourage bonding in that scenario? Is there anything else? You mean if the parents could be in the, are they in the NICU? Yes, yeah. 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 So there's going to be time, you know, there's a lot of situations where the baby's in the NICU and you're not able to hold him. So just to kind of go back to what I was saying about doing skin to skin, you want to, with each shift change of the nurse, just remind them at the NICU is full of amazing doctors and nurses, but there's a lot going on. So you want to be sure and remind them that you do want to hold the baby when you're able to, but talking to the baby, you could read. And it doesn't mean you have to sit next to the baby reading like good night moon. I mean, you can sit next to the baby and read us weekly. Like it doesn't really matter. <laughs> the baby wants to hear your voice and the inflection of your voice and things like that. So reading to the baby, you know, if you're able to hold the baby's hand or things like that, that can be really helpful before you're able to hold it. Okay. Awesome. Is there anything different that people should think about or prepare for in case they get a call about a last minute, you know, stork drop placement, as opposed to when they might have time to prepare during the course of a longer match? I think it's important to, you know, if you're in that adoption process, wherever you are, and it sounds like your listeners might be at the very beginning, or they might just have everything already and they're waiting to be matched. I think it's important to realize that and this is what I say to people all the time is like, you're going to eventually have a baby. So some people feel like almost superstitious about learning about that time or something, but I really encourage it. Like get comfortable with 
the idea of soothing a baby and, and caring for a baby, all, it's okay to not know or to want to watch someone do those everyday tasks of giving a baby a bath or changing a diaper or dressing a baby. And that's what I try to do inside of my program is my advice is get comfortable with all of that because if it is a stork drop situation, you don't want to be thinking, oh my gosh, you know, we don't even know what to do with a baby. And this is a moment you've been waiting for, for years. So take that time to prepare so that you, you feel comfortable either way. This new little human is tricky. Like they newborns, there's no two ways about it. They're a little tricky. So there's going to be things where you're like, what, you know, people will say to me, like, what does this mean? That it, what's he doing right now? It's like, I have no idea. And I've seen <laughs> hundreds of newborns. Who the heck knows? But I think a preparing for that time and knowing what to expect is so helpful. Okay, great. And you've touched on a lot of this. Before we get to my last question, is there anything else that's different for adoptive parents when it comes to newborn care that we haven't yet touched on? I think that, you know, we have touched on quite a bit. I think it goes back to grace, which is something that I've talked about so often. It doesn't matter if you follow me on Instagram, you follow all these people, you take an online course, you do all these things. You're There's still going to be a point where you're thinking like, I feel like I don't really know what I'm doing right now, or what should I do here? Or what do I need? And just your internal monologue to yourself is I'm doing the best I can. Cause sometimes you're like, okay, buddy, I'm going to change your diaper. And then we're going to do this. And this baby is screaming his little head <laughs> off. And it's like, sorry, you know, it goes back to the very first thing we talked about, which is remember, it's just, he's just trying to communicate with something with you here. It's not like he's in horrible pain, but you know, it's, showing yourself grace during that time and saying like, okay, I know this isn't what going as well as you thought it would go at this exact <laughs> right. second, but we're on our way to get a bottle or we're on our way to take a walk or whatever. And just, you know, showing yourself some grace during that time. And what I find is that the adoptive families who I work with so often think like, oh, this is happening because this baby was adopted. It's no, very, there's, I've not been in a situation where I'm like, yep, I think that's probably it. It's <laughs> right. like, no, he's getting used to life in the real world. And so there's going to be some bumps in the road. Great, great. So the last thing I want to talk about is that every new parent needs to find a great pediatrician. And I think it's really important for adoptive parents to work with a doctor and a medical practice who are experienced with adoption and adoptive families. Do you have any advice on how a family can find such a practice? Yeah, I think that's a good point. And this is something that I talk to people about. It's not top of mind for people to find a pediatrician when you're preparing to adopt because you've got all these other things going on or you're waiting, you want to wait. That relationship with your pediatrician is so important. Even if the baby, let's say for the first year, the baby doesn't even go to a sick visit, they're just well visits. You are seeing that pediatrician so many times. It's like mm -hmm. you saw them at two weeks, you saw them at two months, you saw them at four months and it keeps going. So having a pediatrician who you feel comfortable with, you feel like when you ask a question, they're taking the time to answer your question. And sometimes you're, you know, if you're a first time parent, or even if you're not, you're going to ask a question in three different ways, because you're so worried about this thing. And having that pediatrician who's like patient enough to give you the answer three different times. And so I have a pediatrician Q&A is what I call it inside of my course is that because it helps. It's like, I don't even know, 15 questions, I think. And I say to people, highlight the questions that matter to you so that mm -hmm. when you sit down with this person prior, and it could be in person, you could sit with a pediatrician, it could be over Zoom, but just so you have the opportunity to have like a kind of little interview where you're asking questions of what's important to you and understanding if this person is a good fit. As far as finding that pediatrician, Facebook groups, like mommy kind of Facebook groups in your area, your friends, understanding what other people like and kind of letting them rule out like, oh gosh, you definitely don't want to go to this right. person for this reason. <laughs> or here's why I didn't like that practice. Maybe you would. So understanding the recommendation of others is helpful. I don't know. Does that answer? Yeah, no, it's very helpful. Very helpful. So before we wrap up, you have alluded to um, various parts of your program or different things that you offer in your program. Do you want to share kind of a little bit of an overview of your program, what it is and, and what you offer? Sure. Yeah. So my program is called Expecting 101 You're Adopting. And this came about, I had a course for 
families who were pregnant. I had an online course years before that. And then as a doula, I worked with my first family who was preparing to adopt. They were 11 days out from being matched with twin boys. And I have twin boys. So I feel like you could bond over the fact alone that like, that's a blessing, but like, that's a lot of boys. (laughs) We did bond over that. And then as I helped them to prepare to welcome these babies, I learned so much about the adoption process. And even in a, in a city, the size of Philadelphia, I live in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. So I'm about 45 minutes North of Philadelphia, even in a city, the size of Philadelphia for them to get education. And in their case, their agency required a certain number hours of education, but for them to get any type of like newborn care education, they were sitting in a class that was speaking to pregnant families. Right. And so then kind of navigating, oh, this pertains to us and oh, this doesn't. And that felt like awful to me. And so originally my plan was to take, you know, expecting 101, my course for pregnant families and just kind of change things around a little bit and put in some information about bonding. And really I ended up diving into that and re-recording pretty much everything because I want to speak to that situation. I don't want you as an adoptive family to have to, well, she said this, but that probably doesn't pertain to us. I think it's nice as you prepare for this new little person to be able to have that information that's, you know, pretty specific to your situation. And so people have access for two years and that's because I want them to be able to watch the course now. It's totally online. They can watch at home, watch the course now, and then when they're matched or whatever the situation, they can go back. You want to watch me burp a baby or (laughs) change a diaper or give a bath. And, and we have a Facebook group for members only. I just want to be that resource for people. I want to um, be able to answer their questions. I always tell my course members, do not Google, like don't Google. If you have a question (laughs) and it's not in my information, put it in the Facebook group because I will get you the answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that's awesome that you offer the two-year access. Cause like, you know, what we're doing today is trying to just kind of scratch the surface a little bit, take some of the, the scariness and the unknown and the stress out of it. But when the reality happens, of course, people will need to go back and see all of those details in, in real time at that point. For sure. And I have uh, course members who they've watched it and then they're matched and they're like, we're going to rewatch it now (laughs) because, you know, they had watched it like nine months ago or something. So I think it's helpful. Awesome. Well, Valerie, thank you so much for for being with me today. Again, my guest is Valerie Trumbauer and her organization is New Parents Academy. You can follow her on Instagram at New Parents Academy and on YouTube also at New Parents Academy. And listeners, most of all, I'd really like to thank you for tuning in. I hope you've learned something today that you can immediately apply in your life and that may make your family building journey a little less stressful. If you're interested in Valerie's program, there are also links in the show notes here. So please be good to yourselves. Take care and I'll catch you next time.